Welcome to this episode of We the People, a Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, President of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us. History gives us a window into the past that can help guide and shape our future. So it's not surprising that controversy erupted when the New York Times launched its 1619 project, a project that claims that America's founding and almost all aspects of our society are rooted in slavery and not in principles of freedom. Some of the country's most prominent academics have criticized the project for its blatantly false and misleading claims. Yet schools throughout the country have been incorporating it into their curriculum. With me to discuss this topic are leading scholars, Bill McClay and Peter Wood. Bill is the GT and Libby Blankenship Chair in the History of Liberty at the University of Oklahoma and the director of the Center for the History of Liberty. He's the author of the widely acclaimed Land of Hope, an invitation to the great American story. Peter Wood has been the president of the National Association of Scholars since 2009. Before that, he served as provost of the King's College in New York City. He has published several hundred articles and is the author of 1620, a critical response to the 1619 project. In 2019, Peter was awarded the Gene Kirkpatrick Prize for Academic Freedom. Bill and Peter, welcome. So nice to have you. Good to be here. Thank you. Peter, let's start with you. It can be argued that America has many starting points, such as the arrival of the Pilgrims in Massachusetts or the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In your book, you make the case that it started in 1620 with the Mayflower Compact. Why have you chosen this date? as America's founding? Well, I picked it mainly because I was responding to the 1619 project and was looking for the date closest to that that would actually make sense. Uh, Makes 16, sense. 1619 uh, provides the occasion when slaves arrived in Virginia, uh, but 1620 brings us to the Mayflower Compact, which is the first iteration of what eventually would become our Declaration of Independence. It sets out the idea of a self-governing community of people able to frame their own laws, to engage in a certain degree of religious freedom and tolerance for people of different views. It was a model for what became the uh, governance of small towns in first in New England and eventually the whole country. And it was never forgotten. It became the template for how Americans regarded their independence. Bill, let's talk a little bit about the 1619 Project. It claims, as, as mentioned, that America's economic strength, its culture, its electoral system are all the result of slavery. Your book, on the other hand, Land of Hope, offers a far more inspiring interpretation of that. What's the average person to make of these two competing versions, and why did you offer yours? Well, um, first place, I, I should mention that Land of Hope was published before the 1619 Project, and uh, yet there are parts of it that seem uh, uh, as if I was addressing it, which is uh, <laughs> an indication that, that some of the sentiments in the 1619 Project are, are already out there and brewing. But it is interesting, if people pay attention to the historians, uh, and sometimes they shouldn't, but uh, the, 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 all of the most important historians who have spoken out about this have uh, criticized and roundly criticized, even condemned uh, the 1619 Project for, for its falsities and for the, its, its, uh, its lack of perspective on uh, the, the, the actual role of slavery, which is, is considerable. You know that part is true, but they um, they they overdid it. They they vastly overdid it in in saying let's consider the possibility that 1619, which is when the first enslaved uh, Africans were uh, transported to the soil of what would become the United States, uh, that that's the actual founding. I, there's nobody can make any intelligible sense of that as a founding. Uh, it's a, it, you could call it a beginning uh, if you wanted to, but uh, it's not a founding. A founding is something different. When you, when you create the foundation of your house, that's the thing upon which everything else is erected, on which it rests and, and which supports it. 
slavery <laughs> does, does not and, 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 and did not play that kind of role. Uh, they rely on very bad scholarship, which has been, you know, pretty much universally discredited about uh, that exaggerates the economic role of slavery uh, in in early American life. So uh, if people pay attention to the, the experts, for once, the experts will not mislead them. And even though most historians lean left or, or <laughs> more than lean left, uh, they, they, they have a sense of integrity about the evidence and the evidence is just not there to support what in the end was a journalistic hoax or um, gimmick, a journalistic gimmick and not uh, a piece of accurate uh, reporting about the American past. And the, the kids who learn from this stuff are going to be badly misled by it. Peter, related question. Part of the 1619's project purpose, obviously, is to put slavery at the center of understanding American history and to, I think, really distort the positive values of the American founding and the American experiment. Do you think textbooks have historically whitewashed the past and that somehow a more honest assessment is necessary? Well, it depends on how far back we're willing to look. Uh, I've spent considerable time looking at textbooks from 1910 to roughly 1950. And during that period, the treatment of uh, both slavery and the African-American experience is either minimal or condescending. Uh, and if you can, you can mine that for lots of examples of stuff that would outrage contemporary people and appropriately so. It, it was a, a diminishment of the black suffering under slavery and the experience since. But beginning in the 1950s, there was counter push to that. Uh, we began to see some textbooks that treated uh, seriously some aspects of slavery. By 1961, the Anti-Defamation League put out a, a major report calling for a revision of textbooks. That same year was the, the first serious textbook intended for a broad audience that included attention to Brown versus the Board of Education and the Civil Rights Act of 1957. Uh, by 1966, John Pope Franklin and several other historians had put together a, uh, a textbook adopted in California, so it had real reach, uh, titled uh, Land of the Free. And uh, the, the John Hope Franklin textbook became a kind of foundation point for pretty much all subsequent American history textbooks. So if we're, we're willing to turn the clock back before 60 years ago, yes, the treatment of blacks in American history was either minimal or terrible. Um, but after that, there was a gradual acceleration until by the point now in which any American history textbook used in public schools in this country gives ample scope to actual black history. And rightly so, and, and no argument with that at all. But the, the idea that the New York Times puts forward in the 1619 project that this is all new, that any attention to blacks is somehow a, a revolutionary and a great change over the pedagogy in our American schools is absolutely false. You cannot find a mainstream history textbook in this country that does not give ample scope these days to the African-American experience, including slavery. Well, thanks for setting the record straight on that. Bill, Land of Hope is not only an incredible account of American history, but also of human nature. Indeed, the, the founders were well aware of human flaws, uh, which is probably why they were so deliberate about creating a system of checks and balances. Why did you include human nature as part of the context of your book? Well, um... I, I didn't do it in an explicit sort of technical way. I didn't say here, I'm about to give you a lesson on human nature, but what <laughs> I tried to do, what I tried to do is a, a better way of doing that kind of teaching is to weave it in to the account. And, and for issues like, for example, how, what are we to make of figures like Thomas Jefferson, who in some respects are heroic uh, and uh, indubitably part of uh, our national Heritage, one of the treasures of our national heritage, but also men whose uh, whose moral flaws are are conspicuous, are hard uh, to gla gloss over. I mean, Jefferson was such a man. 
we could say the same thing, by the way, about Martin Luther King. Um, and, uh, and, and I think that's a very painful uh, subject for a lot of us because we want to think of him as a kind of national hero. And, and I think he is. I think the, some of the things that have emerged about him, especially in the last year or so, uh, uh, about uh, his, his private life, um, are very disturbing. But um, we have to learn that human nature is a complicated thing, that we are a mixture of the admirable and the unadmirable. Uh, whatever source you use to explain that fact, that is the, what, what we are. We're not uh, perfect or perfectible beings, but we can still have heroes. We can have heroes if we understand that our heroes don't need to be and can't be perfect. So uh, the founders can be our heroes, even if they didn't create uh, a republic that in every jot and tittle, every particular corresponds to we want it, what we want it to be today. They gave us a, a constitution that could be amended. They gave us a structure uh, dealing with human frailty and human selfishness and cupidity uh, as part of the structure of the constitution. And uh, long may it uh, endure. Uh, but uh, they, they, they did not, uh, they were not men uh, who were without faults. Uh, you know, a great many, I think 30 of the 55 were slave uh, uh, signatories uh, were the slaveholders so, uh, of the declaration. So um, it's, we have to learn to understand that complexity of human nature rather than go around and tearing down statues of, for God's sake, Mohandas Gandhi, Frederick Douglass, uh, Miguel de Cervantes. This is absurd. Uh, and it, it is a, it's, it's a ro road to a kind of Jacobin uh, futility uh, in the end, because nobody can live up to the standards that, uh, that, that are being set thereby. Well said. I just wish that more in our society would, would heed that advice. Uh, in, in these difficult times. Last question for both of you. America is really in a period of great uncertainty right now. And I was just alluded to by Bill, fueled by partisan politics, social media, cancel culture. What do you think of the lessons from America's history that can guide our country successfully into the future? Peter, start with you. Well, our history is one of overcoming obstacles. Some of those were of the obstacles of, of nature and a, a continent that was not easily tamed. Many of the obstacles were ones that are rooted in our high ideals. We set forth for this country a plan to uh, be both free and to pursue equality. And those were not easily achieved things. They weren't a representation of everything that had already happened. They were the goals that we put forth and we struggled mightily for the last several hundred years. And the struggle continues to be better exemplars of those ideals. That seems to me is the, the history that needs to be put forth. Uh, we have, I, I think at least in Bill's uh, textbook, one example of how that can be taught and taught well, but uh, we are faced here with uh, the continuing obstacle of telling our own story in a manner that is compelling and realistic and that helps young people become uh, attached in a positive way to their own country. Without that, we don't have a country. We really depend Correct. on people absorbing those ideals and making them real in their lives. Bill? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that our history is replete with examples of obstacles we've overcome, as Peter suggests, and, and of very difficult times uh, that we've somehow managed. And, and we're, we're often very divided. Uh, I'd like to give the example of uh, the year 1941, uh, early in 1941, when uh, you know, the, the Hitler was in control of continental Europe only the British Isles were holding out, and the American people were still resolutely opposed to uh, becoming involved in this conflict. And uh, the the uh, and, and the nation was furiously divided. In fact, uh, and it's at this point that uh, John Dos Passos, the novelist, wrote a wonderful essay called "The Use of the Past," in which, among other things, he says that uh, the, an understanding of the past is like a lifeline in the scary present. 
and and it frees us from the notion that we live in an unprecedented era. And we certainly need that. We are, especially our young people, are under the the illusion that history began, you know, with the iPhone, and there, not, nothing <laughs> happened before that. Uh, it was it was uh, no struggle was involved, no uncertainty was involved, no uh, uh, heroic achievement was involved in placing them in the the status that they now enjoy. And um, that so so uh, and, and uh, those passos is. Uh, quote, which I use for the epigraph of my book, Land of Hope, is is uh, is really a, a wonderful tonic against this notion, as he says, that the idiot delusion of the exceptional now is what we have to fight. Uh, the the idea that there, there's nothing in the past that can it can teach us uh, uh, wrong, wrong, wrong. And one of the things it can teach us is that we're part of something. We're part of something much bigger and longer and more various and more complicated, but that is at the root of our being. We're part of it uh, and we need to own that uh, in every sense of the word. Terrific. Bill McClay and Peter Wood, thanks so much for joining us and thanks for your leadership Thank you. and courage on this very important topic. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us on this episode of We the People.